Yeah, so this talk's really on designing a successful restoration project. So we've had some of the principles earlier, so we'll be repeating that um, a little bit. So again, you'll hear, you're hearing this a bit, the right plant in the right place. Um, yeah, so in my talk, I'm going to uh, cover uh, various things. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so what's the first thing is that planning, really. What's the, the purpose of, of the planting project or the project you're looking at doing? Um, and so in context, here's a definition of restoration. So uh, recreating what was previously there with the appropriate native plants for the site. Whereas amenity planting is to enhance an area using native and possibly exotic plants which may or may not have been originally found in that habitat. But there can be you know, lots of objectives for, for a site, and that's the key thing of what, what people want to achieve with their site. So is it recreate native habitat and ecosystems? Is it a, to buffer or enhance waterways? Maybe create ecological linkages and sequences? Maybe restore threatened plants? Create and enhance habitat for native wildlife or other species? Or well, it could be to create some sort of resource. Examples could be for flax for weaving or, or some other resource. So sort of carrying on that theme, you know, what are the goals? So is it to restore an existing degraded habitat? Or is it to create a new habitat? Are you looking at improving uh, water quality? Or is it just something that you want to appreciate and like the look of, so more for the aesthetics and landscape um, amenity, you know, the landscape scenery values? You know, is it something that you want to bring the community together and involve maybe neighbours or schools? Or is it all these things? Um, and multiple goals and benefits are great. Yeah. So what kind of planting site do you have? And so, in particular, what are the main environmental stresses of that site? So is it wind? Um, is it frost, drought, salt exposure, high water tables, or something else? So those are the th key things that may limit uh, the success to your restoration, and you'll need to plan for. You know, what are the soils that you have? Oops. <laughs> Is it loam? Is it a sandy soil which may dry out? Is it gravelly or rocky? Is it a peat soil that's going to be waterlogged? Is it a mineral soil? You know, is it glade which also will indicate at least seasonal waterlogging? Or is it some other soil type? And digging it a little bit deeper, uh, what's, what is the soil depth? The soil fertility, the, the drainage features, um, moisture and water table, the stoniness of the sites. So all these factors with the soils will determine the choice of plants and the conditions that they can tolerate. Another thing is being really aware of what you've got on that site already. So if there's existing biodiversity, you want to work with it and enhance it. You, you need to be cautious that you're not getting rid of what's already there. And one example I see quite often is when people put in a pond, they put it in the wettest place in the paddock and it's probably got native vegetation already there, so you can destroy the native vegetation you've got to create, you know, destroy one habitat to create another, really. Um, and some of that biodiversity may be easy to overlook, um, and so sometimes it may be in a wet paddock, you've got a range of short native herbs, so be aware if you're planting forest species, you're going to lose those, that diversity that you have. And um, I'll jump down one there. Yeah, so uncultivated soils even can be important and may uh, retain important biodiversity. And in places like the Southland Plains and Canterbury Plains, that's really important to you know that, that everything is, is modified to a high level. So even if you don't have the vegetation, those soil intact soils can be quite significant. And as Bruce said, the forests. Um, and the birds are only part of the equation. You know, we want to look wider at those multiple goals and, and other values that we can, we can have or, or create. Look at the site and other ecological sequences. So that might be moisture or soil types. You know, is there patterning there? And 
So in the planning for that, as, as Bruce said, that if you're working to that diversity, you'll be maybe putting in different mixes of species across that site. Also, are there existing plants that can be built on and, and give you shelter? So in some cases, that might be what we consider weed species, but you might leave some of them there to get shelter and then progressively take them out later. You know, and gorse can be a nurse crop. It's not just a problem. Again, find a reference site. That'll give you a good idea of maybe what you want to recreate. So it'll give an image of your mind of, of what you want to achieve and you know, what species and things you might want. So starting with maps and aerial photos, uh, thinking about the zones you're in, so the broad zones of, of being coastal, um, which is going to be probably windy and have more salt exposure, you know, the inland zone, or, uh, lowland zone, and the inland zone. So the inland zone in Southland's going to generally have harder <coughs> or heavier frosts um, and probably more uh, prone to drought as well. Um, yeah, so look around, what are the, the nearest patches of vegetation um, and are they similar to, potentially to the site you're looking to work on? You know, what are the regenerating species, the canopy species? Are there rare and notable species there that you might want to put in and enhance as well? And so the key thing is choosing plants that are hardy to the environment and the situation. Again, we've had this plant in the successional order, so putting in those colonising hardier species first, and they're going to create the conditions for a lot of the other species that will follow, the canopy, and then other species to come in. So those epiphytes, um, the ground cover species, will, will follow. So when we think about <coughs> the sites and the diversity there are, so forest, I've listed a few here, but there's a whole range of forest um, ecosystems and, and associations. So what, what was on the site that you would have had? What's the diversity that you can create? Again, the riparian sites. You know, we, we think of Kowai Ribbonwood Forest, but there's a whole realm of, of things that would have been in that situation. There's a raft of shrubland types, of wetland types, of tussock, sand dunes. And so thinking about that, that patterning and sequences and trying to maximise the diversity that we'll, we'll achieve. So again, in choosing the plants, Again, looking at what are, what are the conditions that you've got in your site, what are the sequences, and what's appropriate for those different zones, um, and particularly this the stress. Um, so, what's the flooding frequency, or where does the frost pull when it's hardest? Where are the more drought drought prone places? Those north facing slopes, those sorts of of things. And in choosing the plants. You know, there's lots of resources that um, cover these sort of factors. So, how what's the form of the plant? So, how big does it grow? You know, how water tolerant and um, water logging tolerant is it? To wet or to dry? Mm -hmm. uh, to sun exposure or shade and frost? <laughs> you know, so there, there are resources that are going to tell us what conditions the plants will thrive in. And so, putting in the, the plants that are going to thrive in a particular situation. So also thinking about eco-sourcing. So one definition is referring to the propagation of native plants from local areas and planting them back within the same region. So the eco-sourced plants um, help to preserve the ecological distinctiveness of an area and they'll survive better. They're adapted to those local conditions so they're going to thrive in those conditions. So does it matter? Well, choosing plants that survive best at your site, um, you're going to have better success. It's, it's going to save you money and probably speed up the, the growth. So plants from the coast uh, will be more probably wind and salt tolerant. Plants from inland areas will be more frost tolerant. And many of you probably remember the big freeze as we call it of 95 or 96. That example with flax, where flax had been harvested from some people and moved around for shelter belts. And we found those coastal ones, um, they were 
probably survived in the lesser frost, but where those coastal plants were planted inland, a lot of them died or frosted uh, on those shelter belts, and particularly when it went into the, the um, hollows where cold air sat. You know, so things like that um, sort of prove these theories are, are worthwhile. Yeah, so choosing the plants that are appropriate to the habitat you're trying to create, and retaining and enhancing vegetation that's special to Southland is also something you can achieve. So, and that might be building in some of the, the uh, local and, and threatened species that, that are found here. So, a few tips um, to, to eco sourcing, and also thinking some funding sources do require you to, to be eco sourcing, so you, you probably may need to think about it. So when you're dealing with nurseries, you should ask, so were the plants grown from seed? Obviously, if they're seed, they're coming from a range of genetics. It's not just a cutting from a single plant or a single clone. Were they from, collected from the wild? So if you're collecting from a planted population, are you sure that that was a natural site? It wasn't plants that were brought in from the North Island originally or, or from wherever. Was the plant collected from multiple parent plants? So again, having that increased diversity. And that might be important with some of the disease events we're getting. If you've got that increased diversity, you're more likely to have a proportion um, of those plants that'll, that'll die. If you've got a clone and it's susceptible, you might lose all those plants. So what was the eco district that was sourced from? So if the um, nursery owner or supplier can't necessarily answer those questions, then you should possibly look at um, another nursery or supplier. You could consider or, or possibly collecting seeds and giving it to that grower so that they've got the right stock. You know, Generally they'll want to do the right thing so if you can help them. Um, or you might look at growing your own plants. So also another example for eco sourcing is with manuka. We know that manuka in different areas has different forms and we suspect that there's several different taxa or species. So those local variations uh, or forms will have a genetic basis. With Carnica, the related species, the, the research there increased the number from two to 10 uh, species. And we suspect the same will happen with Manuka. That works underway at the moment. Um, and so the planting of Manuka for the uh, Manuka or for the honey industry, if you're moving um, plants around, bring them into areas where they weren't, you could be hybridising the, the populations and some of those really rare and local forms could get hybridised and we could lose them just by moving these things around. But another reason again, I know in Tiano Basin there was planting of, of um, East Coast North Island plants which are thought to be the, the best with some of the properties uh, planted and they're almost all killed in the first winter. Heavy frosts coming from totally different zone and they didn't survive. So again, you know, saving yourself money as well. So where to get plants from? So you know, nurseries that do eco source, those nurseries that are growing lo from local Southland stock. So be aware of the internet buying. They might be cheaper, but if those plants are gonna die, it's, it's not actually a cheap option. Collecting plants from the wild, and so again, away from gardens, so that you know whether that they are natural plants, not something that's been brought in originally. Uh, you shouldn't ideally break, uh, dig up seedlings from the wild, and the temptation quite often is to plant out big plants, but a lot of them are going to die. So again, if you are going to move plants, small seedlings, grow them on, let them establish, and then plant them out. Um, and again, you can grow your own plants, but one key thing, make sure you've got the owner's permission wherever you're collecting um, any material from. Another thing here, particularly for Southland, um, is be aware of non-local species. So we've got a number of plants that do well in our condition, but they, um, yeah, they're, they're basically weeds. So Cabrosma robusta, the Karamu, Taupata, uh, largely Cabrosma, and the worst is probably Hoheria sextilosa. <coughs> so there's formulas for um, cal calculating plant numbers, and 
you know, I think with building trees, there's going to be pressure to go out to three or four metres. But from Curry's work, we've we've heard the benefits of, of keeping with the tried and known those densities of maybe one to one and a half metres at, at most. So site preparation. Sorry, do I jump on? Oh no, sorry. Uh, yeah, so threats and solutions. So um, you know, stock need to be permanently ex uh, excluded. So electric fence aren't necessarily that secure. Um, we want to think about the browsing animals. Uh, so you can put on combi guards or you can spray with um, pest repellents. Thinking about the browsing animals as well. So if you're wanting to enhance the wildlife or maintain that, you've got to control the pests. And of course, plants for um, pests. So the worst of those in a planting situation quite often is the grass board that you start off, but there's a whole range of, of plant pests that you might have. So you want to make sure that the area is stock proof. You want to uh, spray, so it might be a blanket spray or spot spray, at least four weeks before planting. Use combi guards or protectors and or mulch. And then release spraying at least twice a year. Um, just top of this. So how long will it take? So it probably depends on your site and the conditions, but you know it it does take a long term time to get a forest. And recording your work. So this is our pond from when it was first dug uh, to what it looks like now. So we'll see that this afternoon, and it's worth just having a few photos. They're, they're amazing. So involving the school and community. And just a few tips here. So the first is the most important probably, do the preparation, the planning, preparation, maintenance. The planting's the easy bit. So don't bite off more than you can chew. So plant what you can ma uh, maintain. So stage the planting, work in discrete areas, um, and build upon that planting are probably the good principles. Again, the planning, it's going to take a year, 18 months, or even up to three years to have the suitable stock for things like kakatea, to have good, big, healthy plants. Think about the planting time, so avoid the worst stresses. And if it's a dry site, plant a little bit deeper. And conversely, if it's wet, you can maybe raise the plant up with soil. So we've got lots of sources of information. Yeah, so just in summary, the why, what do you want to achieve, the what, what ecosystems, zones, species do you want to concentrate on, the where, what are the conditions and constraints, when, the time frames, uh, lead in time, the time of year for planting, the how, techniques, preparation, and how much, what rate you want to work at. Thank you.